Matthew 4, 12 through 25. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphilia, and some other words I can't pronounce. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphilia, along the road by the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is also called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Then the news about him spread throughout Syria. So they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, the paralytics, and he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for today. We thank you for the blessing for being able to be here today. And Lord, just proclaim your word. Lord, I pray right now that, Lord, we would get anything out of our mind that is keeping us from seeing and hearing your word. Lord, I, I pray that we would just experience just the power of the Holy Spirit in, in our lives that would transform us to be used completely uh, by you and for your glory. Lord, I'm thankful to be here in Hopewell, Virginia, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, I'm thankful for what you've done in our first six years. And I look forward in anticipation for what you're going to do in the coming years. And Lord, the great thing about it is when I hear people say God is moving, the fact of the matter is you're not the one who ever stopped moving. Lord, we need to join in your work for your glory and we would see true revival in this community. So, Lord, as I preach your word now, Lord, may, may I decrease and you increase and you get all the glory. And someone is here today that doesn't know you, doesn't know whether we're spending eternity, may today be the day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name, amen. I have entitled today's message, There is no upgrade over Jesus. There's no upgrade over Jesus. Like, we're living in America. We get tired of things pretty easily. Like, we want to constantly look for an upgrade, right? It seems like there's a new iPhone that comes out every year, right? And we've got to get it. We've got to spend, I don't even know what they are now. What are they, like $1,000 for an iPhone? It feels like, is it more? I don't even, I don't even know, all right? I'm going back to the Blackberry. Um, but I think that, I think that we get so tired, and we're like, Everything, restaurants and manufacturers are always trying to upgrade things in cars. Like when I grew up, uh, the cars that we, we had when I grew up had uh, 460 air conditioning. Whoever had the 460 air conditioning? Do you remember? Y'all remember that? The kids are like, I, I've never heard of that before. You roll all four windows down to go 60 miles an hour, and that's how you have air conditioning, right? That's where we are. But that, we get spoiled, so we actually had to put AC in cars. And now we're to the point that literally each seat in some cars can control the exact temperature and comfort level that they want. Even some cars have AC in the seats for Pete's sakes. And this is what we've come to. There's no stopping. I even saw this week, um, there's a new car coming out that, that parks itself. Now, there have been cars that have parked themselves. You're in the car, you park, you hit a button, and it kind of parallel parks for you. That that's came out about 10 years ago. But this car that came out this week, Literally, you get out the car, and then it parks itself, so you don't have to worry about hitting your car door on the car next to you that has been parking. Isn't that crazy? Like, and I started thinking about it. There's no um, limit to where people will go, especially in America, trying to upgrade. And sadly, you know that churches are no different? Like, 
You would be amazed at the amount of advertising material that I get in every week on how to upgrade things in our church. And this is how you're going to reach people. This is how. You need to do this. You need to plan back to church Sunday. You've got to have Super Bowl Sunday. All these things to reach people. Now, I fully believe that we, as a church and as human beings, should always try to strengthen our weaknesses. We should always try to get better. But when it comes to reaching people, I don't know why the American church feels like they need to upgrade over the way that Jesus reached people. If it was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us, church. There is no upgrade over Jesus. You know, one of the blessings of starting a church from scratch is we kind of get to put our own DNA on it. We get to kind of put together the way that we want things to happen. Instead of, as a senior pastor, when I came into my first senior pastor, having to assimilate into what is already there, and it's very difficult. And so, when we started Beacon Hill, we looked around at what other churches were doing. And some of those things we assimilated into our church. Matter of fact, if you're here, um, or if you ever come in for the first time and you got that little welcome bag, the welcome bag with a little tumbler um, and a pen, that is modeled after Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so we saw, man, that's a great way to welcome people and do it. So we did that. But our model on how we do things is not designed after the American church. It is designed after the early church. If you've been here any length of time, or, or if you're checking out Beacon Hill, the best way that you can see what we're about and how we do church is to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and see that the way that the early church did it. And that's what we try to model our church after. We love living life together. We love studying the Word together. We love being out in the community together. And you know what they did in the early church? They did that, and people were added to the number every single day. Why do we want to do anything different, church? It was good enough for Jesus. It should be good enough for us. Look, our model is just like the early church. And our methods on how we reach people is also similar to what Jesus used in his ministry. So we look, as we study it through Matthew, we learn that Jesus came on the scene and he was baptized by John. And we saw that wonderful thing, something we've been studying over the last couple of weeks. And last week we, we saw where Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, John's ministry would start to decrease as Jesus' ministry would increase. And so the text starts off today with a statement that John had been arrested. So Jesus withdrew to Galilee. It was to fulfill scripture, but it was also a place where Jesus would make his home base in his early ministry. Isaiah called this place the Galilee of the Gentiles, where, where people lived in darkness. Now, Isaiah prophesied this 750 years before Jesus would come onto the scene. And when people were living in darkness, by the time that Jesus started his ministry, people were literally sitting in darkness. Over half of the place that Jesus came in Capernaum were Gentiles. And without getting too deep, that basically means that they were lost people. They didn't know Jesus Christ. And the people who thought they were saved, they thought they were religious Pure, they actually despised lost people and had no interest in actually reaching them. It's no wonder why Jesus chose this place to bring the light. Jesus is all about bringing light into the darkness. I don't know if you're tracking with me yet this morning. We didn't come to hope. Well, we didn't. When we started Beacon Hill, we didn't look for like one of the easiest places to do ministry. We didn't say, look, I want to go where the rich people are and they got it all, or they think they got it all together. No, we said, Jesus, send us into the midst of darkness and help us bring the light of Christ into the town. Amen. One of the great theologians of our time is named Tim Keller. <coughs> Has anybody ever heard Tim Keller's name? Yeah. Tim Keller's first ministry, he just uh, retired from, from his church, uh, and actually there's no retiring from serving Jesus. He went right. into uh, teaching seminary. But uh, it's a brilliant theologian of our time, has lots of books, but his first pastorate was an interim pastor. It's supposed to be three months, and it was in a place called Hopewell, Virginia. And he's one of the most famous pastors that we have um, today, and very stout in his knowledge. 
And I was reading a new book about him that came, came out about his life and ministry. And it was talked about how him and his wife came into Hopewell. Imagine, hey, he was from Boston area. Imagine coming into Hopewell, Virginia, and this is where you're going to start ministry. You've never been here. And he came in in 1975. And they came across the, the bridge. And they saw nothing but chemical plants. And they saw the smoke. Now we take that for granted, right? That's normal for us now, right? And his wife said, his wife said, we are going to die here. <laughs> That's what she said. And so proud, so proud was Hopewell um, of the chemical plants because they provided jobs that they actually had signs saying, welcome to the chemical capital of the South. That's what they had there. They have since taken those down and replaced it with a big H when you come across the building, right? So look. Apparently, the toxins that were being spilled into the water here in the James River were so bad as ketone was being spilled in. Y'all remember that? Yes. That that literally they banned fishing. They banned fishing, and you couldn't eat any of the fish in the James River for a long time because they were diseased. And that's crazy when you think about Hopewell that our fish are as jacked up as our people. All right, I'm just saying. When we came to Hopewell in 2016, and God placed us here, when you walked downtown, and those of y'all who are from Hopewell, you know what I'm saying. Those of y'all who were here from the beginning, you know what I'm saying. You couldn't walk within a block of here without seeing a drug deal take place, without seeing an unsheltered. Matter of fact, there were 40 unsheltered people living within a three-block radius of this building when we came here. And we went and started telling them about Jesus. And started inviting them to come and hear about Jesus. And through partnership with a lot of different organizations and our ministries here, we have seen over 19 unsheltered people get homes and are now off the streets. Amen. It's all God's glory. So now you walk through Hopewell, and some people complain about it. Try six years ago. And so when we're, this is our base, this is our home, this is like Jesus' home base, this is what our home base is. But one of the things that we're determined to do at Beacon Hill is to bring the light into darkness. So when we hear, when we hear about things um, that are happening in Hopewell, in danger in Hopewell, we don't want to run from the danger, we want to run to the danger, church. We have a desire, a strong desire, to see the darkest places of the well flip upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how do we do that? How, how are we doing that? And, and, and we'll get back to verse 17 here in a little bit. But we need people to help us do what God has called us to do. And verses 18 through 20 gives us insight into some of the first people that came to be a part of Jesus' ministry. And so we see the calling of the first disciples here in verses 18 through 22. So stay with me. If you have your Bibles, please open them up. Keep them open. Verses 18 through 22, we look at the first disciples. So as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them immediately, and they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, if you were just reading Matthew and you isolated from the other Gospels, you would think, matter of fact, we were in the back, we always go over the sermon at 9 o'clock, anybody that wants to come, we go over the sermon, we talk about it, and we pray at 10 o'clock, and then we're out here at 11. And we talked about it. You would think that if you just read Matthew, you would think this is the first time that Jesus had ever encountered these men that he would call a follower. Don't you? But if you look at Luke, you actually see that this isn't the first time that Jesus came in and called these people. John 1, 29 through 42, if you want to write that down, tells of their first meeting. So it's not like Jesus just came up to some complete strangers and said, you follow me, and they went. Okay? They had some knowledge of who Jesus was before the call. They had the, not, the, the, the background of it. Now, some commentators look get into the and what it's like to fish for men versus uh, fish, you know, for fish, and have a similarity to comparison. But this is not what the text is about. We've got to stay with the text. And so here at Beacon Hill, we just preach what the text says and not what the text does not say. Amen? 
So let's look at some things that the text actually says about the people who were the first followers of Jesus. One, they followed him immediately, church. They followed him immediately. Verse 20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Simon and Andrew were out fishing when Jesus made an offer to them that would change the trajectory of their life. He said, follow me and I will teach you and I will make you fish for people. They had a choice to make. Would they simply uh, stay with, with in their comfort zone or would they take what they knew about Jesus and follow him? Would they take him up on his offer or would they stay on the boat doing what they knew what to do? Think about this. Would you follow Jesus if you knew how it would all end? Temporally? Think about this. Seriously. How, how, did, how did some of these disciples die? Like the first one here, the first one that we're talking about, Peter, he would actually be crucified upside down. So imagine if I said, hey, come with us to Five Forks and you're going to die today. Get on the bus. And you're going to die. Like, how many of you would come and follow Jesus and know he's going to come? Yeah, yeah. They didn't know what to come, but they knew that they wanted to follow Jesus. What choice would they make? The scripture says that they immediately left their nets and followed him. It didn't say where they were going. It didn't say, hey, just keep watching and seeing if this is what I want to do. They didn't take baby steps. They immediately answered the call to follow Jesus. And when Jesus calls you to be a part of his work, there is no excuse for delay because delay is disobedience, church. If God is calling you to be a part of his work and you delay, you are not only being disobedient, but you're missing out on what God wants you to be a part of in his work for his glory. Look, I, uh, I was talking about this part I added. If you got the sermon, this is not in the notes. I, I added it when I was reading over it this morning. When we went to Five Forks three weeks ago, um, it's been a blessing in Five Forks. And if you've been a part of our ministry in Five Forks, it, it is it's awesome. It is it is it's great. But I had breakfast with pastors about three weeks ago at Golden Corral. And one of the pastors from Hopewell came up to me. And they go, hey, I think it's great what y'all are doing in Five Forks. And then they go, are you scared? And I'm like... No, no, I'm not. I'm scared of getting on an airplane, but not going to Five Forks. I'm like, no. And then they go, this, this is what they followed up. Seriously. They go, do you take women with you too? And I'm like, and I go, and we take children too. Like that. It's like, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me, but that's the mentality. If God is calling you to be a part of the ministry of Beacon Hill and what we are doing, I've got news for you today. Get on the bus today. Get on the bus and be a part of what God is doing. Do not delay. Get on the bus and be a part of what God is doing immediately. But secondly, we see in Scripture, not only did they answer the call immediately, but sacrificially. Verses 21 through 22. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. In verse 20, we see a level of sacrifice when Andrew and Peter left their jobs to follow Jesus. But when we get to these verses, we see just how serious and how sacrificial the call to follow Jesus is meant to be. James and John not only left their boats and all that they knew, but they also left their father to follow Jesus. How would you feel if you were Zebedee? How would you feel if you were their father and they left you to follow this man named Jesus? We talked back stage a little bit earlier. Some people said, you know what, I'd be upset because that's, that's my money making. That's how we make money. And my, my kids help me make money. And they're leaving, leaving this high drive for me to do all the work. And that natural flesh comment? How would you feel if your children came up to you and said that they wanted to follow Jesus in some of the most dangerous places in the world? How would you respond? It's easy to say, oh, I would be excited until they actually do it. Amen. You really have to, you have to make this question. How, how am I going to do it? How am I going to feel? Would you be mad or would you be proud? 
You look through the Bible, and this is the type of sacrifice that God is calling us to make to follow Him. In Matthew 8, one of His followers was like, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, what? Let the dead bury their own dead. There is a sacrifice to be made to follow Jesus. The American church has made it easy and acceptable and normal to fit Jesus into your schedule. But we are to radically abandon our lives for the sake of the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What sacrifices are you making to follow Jesus? What, what sacrifices are you doing? Say, so like my dad, my dad who's gone on the board now, never did understand why I would leave a secure job and go into ministry. He never, he never did understand it. I mean, until he died, he never understood. And quite frankly, up until two years before I submitted to the call of ministry, I wouldn't have thought I would do it either. I had no clue that I would come and do something like this. But you know what? When Jesus calls you, You've got to make a sacrifice. What sacrifices have you made to follow Jesus, church? What has it cost you to follow Jesus? So we got to do immediate, and we got to do sacrificial. But thirdly, we see in this text from verses 18 through 22, the whole thing, is that we got to get out of our comfort zones. Church, what's our number one saying at Beacon Hill? Get comfortable being uncomfortable. This is what these guys do. They didn't know anything but fishing. It's what they did all day, every day. And that's a pretty cool life if you're into fishing, right? You get to fish for a living. Your friends and family get to do it with you. How much better could it be? Like you think about when, I, when, I, when we left Mount Pleasant, it was, it was very hard for us. It was very hard because it was our comfort zone. It's where our friends were. It's, it's, it's all that we knew. It's where I came to Christ. It's where... I came into the pastor, and then God says, I want you to go. I just want you to go. You know how hard that was? I mean, I literally cried. I mean, it was painful. And I look back at it, and I'm like, this is what God is calling us to do. I'm forever grateful for how God has, has, has grown us in this ministry, the people that God has brought us in our lives. And there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who, who are in the same boat. They're struggling. They're like, man... I got this comfort zone and, and I, I love what I'm doing, but I'm really called to this type of ministry. And a lot of people go, I will help you as long as I can stay in my comfort zone. And nowhere in the Bible does it allow for that. Nowhere in the Bible are we called to stay in our comfort zone. He says, if you want me to be a part of what I'm doing, leave where you are and join in my work. Now, I want to say this. Not everyone is called to do what we do. Not everyone is called to do what we do. That's fine. There's different callings. That's why there's different churches. Jesus has a calling for each and every single person. There are people that are not called to do what we do, and I'm perfectly okay with that. I have great friends, good friends, who are like, man, I love what Beacon Hill is doing, but it's not for me and my family. And that's okay. That's not judgmental. I, I, I'm not their Holy Spirit. No judgment zone. But to be called here and be a part of what we're doing and not go all in is not what Jesus is calling us to do. If Jesus is calling us to make an impact in five forks and in different parts of the well, our call must be immediate, it must be sacrificial, and it must be one that gets us out of our comfort zone. So think about that. So then we look at Jesus' approach to ministry, right? So I've, I've, I've explained what we need to do. This is what, if you're being called, what we have to do. You have to do it today. Don't delay. You have to make sacrifices, and you have to get out of your comfort zone. But a lot of us don't know how to do that. And so now we're going to look on how Jesus did it, how Jesus made an impact where he was. I mentioned earlier that we didn't try to reinvent the wheel when we came to do ministry. We looked at how Jesus did ministry, and we go, what? That's good enough for us. And Jesus had a three-pronged approach to ministry. He had a ministry of preaching, he had a ministry of teaching, and he had a ministry of healing. And I want to share with that right now with you. Jesus' primary approach to reaching people was preaching. It is to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Preaching is not just for preachers. Preaching is for every believer in here. We are called to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make Him known. And how do we make Him known? 
There's only one way to heaven, and that is through the name of Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ can you get to heaven. Only by repenting of your sins and trusting Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. There is no other way to heaven. And that is the message that Jesus preached. That is the message that I preach. And that is the message that you are called to preach anywhere and everywhere for the glory of God. Amen. We're called to preach the good news of God for Jesus Christ. People in darkness need to know about the light. And you and I are the light in the midst of darkness. We, we have been given the message of reconciliation between a broken and sinful world and an unbreakable Savior, church. This is what Romans says, 10, 14. How then can they call on Him who they not believe? And how can they believe without hearing about Him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sinned? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Church, preach Jesus. Preach Jesus Christ. Never stop preaching Jesus. Never stop preaching John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Never stop preaching Jesus. Never stop preaching John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Never stop preaching Jesus. We don't need to share with people seven ways to have a better temporal life. We need to share with people the one way to have eternal life, and His name is Jesus. Our primary message is to preach Jesus. His second approach and method of ministry was teaching. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. I just preached. That's the difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is what we must proclaim. Teaching is what we must do once people place their faith and trust in Jesus. The way that Jesus taught his disciples was by living life with them. They were out and about all over Galilee and they got to learn from watching Jesus and learning. But like our community groups, our community groups that are throughout the week are designed to, to shore up your faith. You know, when you follow Jesus, the only thing that you need to know before you follow Jesus is you're a sinner and He's the only Savior. And you need to follow Him. But then it's our job, as the Great Commission calls us to do, to teach people about Jesus. And our community groups are designed to help you grow your base and your foundation in Jesus. But not only that, that's not only how we learn as a church. How did the disciples learn what it was like to be the hands and feet of Jesus? They got to go out and see how Jesus did it. And I'm telling you, like some of you are like, how do we reach the homeless? How do we, how do we reach five forks? The best way that I can encourage you to learn is to get involved in a ministry and you will learn how to reach people. You can't learn from the sidelines. You gotta, you gotta learn from being on the field. You've got to be out there. You've got to be invested. You know, I had great mentors in my life who, who taught me, like, when I started working with, with unsheltered people, I was in uh, Monroe Park, and I was handing out, I would take the bus, and I would come back, and then we were on Commerce Street, um, in, uh, route, off of Route 1 South one day, and, and then Wynn Fox said, uh, Michael, you're going to preach today. And I, 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 was, I was like, what? And the next thing I know, I'm on top of a picnic table, preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I never thought I was ever capable of that. But if God calls you to it, He'll bring you through it, church. And so I started preaching, and then all of a sudden, I ended up in a place called Hopewell, Virginia, preaching and doing the exact same thing other people taught me how to do in other places. You learn by being involved. You want to learn how to, to do this ministry, get involved in the ministry. So Jesus, He, he preached, He teached, but His third ministry was healing. The method that Jesus used to reach people was healing. Verses 23 through 25 shows that Jesus was healing every disease and sickness among the people. And what was happening was his word was being spread throughout Syria so much that people were bringing anybody who was in need to him. The, the scripture says they were bringing the afflicted, people were suffering with diseases, intense pains, demon possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and I'm pretty sure they misspelled Syria in the Bible with Hopewell. Because we have all of those here in Hopewell as well. We have a lot of the same things that are happening. 
And so there's much to learn about what Jesus did and why he did it. The first thing that we see, this is not about our ability to heal. Jesus is the only one who can heal. He's the healer. But we learn that, that Jesus' healing ministry was subordinate to his preaching ministry. He used his healing ministry to be able to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, church. Jesus never forgot his primary purpose was to preach the kingdom and then teach people about the kingdom. He used the healing ministry as a means to share his primary ministry. 